Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. It was September 17th, 2005, and I'm sitting in my deer blind, minding my own business, when out of nowhere, I start hearing this bizarre, gibberish hollering. I mean, seriously, it sounded like a bunch of nonsensical noises coming from behind me, roughly a hundred yards away. Now, you might think, uh, it's probably just some wildlife or maybe some rowdy teenagers messing around. But let me tell you, this wasn't your ordinary woodland creature or prankster. This gibberish hollering, it started moving y'all. It was heading from east to west, getting closer and closer to where I was sitting. And let me tell you, that's when things started to get real and settling. Feeling a mix of curiosity and nerves, I unzipped the back of my deer blind and grabbed my trusty field glasses. I wanted to get a glimpse of whatever was causing such a ruckus and scaring away the deer. But guess what? When I peered through those glasses, there was nothing to be seen. Nada. Zilch. It was as if this bizarre noise had no visible source. Now, that's enough to make anyone's heart skip a beat. As if the situation wasn't unnerving enough, the sound kept getting closer. And my anxiety levels started to skyrocket. Mind you, I had all the proper permissions to be hunting in that area. But that didn't stop the fear from creeping in. And that's when it hit me. Literally hit me. The most peculiar stench I've ever encountered. It was a mix of damp, musty roadkill and, believe it or not, dirty diapers. Yeah, I know, it sounds repulsive. And trust me, it was. The combination of the advancing noise, the invisible presence, and the ghastly odor forced me to make a quick decision. I had to prioritize my safety above all else. Without wasting a moment, I readied my bow, knocked an arrow, and made a swift exit from the deer blind. Fear wrapped its icy fingers around my heart as I made a beeline away from the disturbance, not daring to look back. But here's the kicker, folks. As I emerged from the woods, heading toward my trusty vehicle, parked approximately 25 yards away, I heard it again. That gibberish hollering was still going on, but this time it was coming from the parallel wood, about 20 yards from where I was. Can you imagine? It felt like I was being trailed by an invisible tormentor. And let me tell you, that sent shivers down my spine like nothing before. At that point, panic took over, and I wasn't taking any chances. With my bow firmly drawn and ready for action, I sprinted toward my truck. I was ready to defend myself against whatever unseen force was doggedly following my every move. Yet despite my heightened senses and the intensity of the situation, there was still no sign of anything. No movement, no figure lurking amidst the trees. It was as if I was being pursued by a goat. Finally, I reached my truck, my heart pounding in my chest. I quickly released my bowstring without letting the arrow loose, placing my bow carefully in the back seat of my trusty Suburban. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I fired up the engine and wasted no time in making my exit. I can tell you this, folks. In all my years of hunting bears, wild pigs, and deer, never had I experienced such 
a gut-wrenching need to flee the woods. So there you have it, the unforgettable tale of my eerie encounter in the swamp bottoms of West River. It was a day that forever changed the way I view the wilderness, reminding me that even among the beauty and tranquility of nature, unseen forces can stir, evoking fear and uncertainty. On to the next one. In the fall of 2011, a friend and I went camping just outside of Kingsbury, Indiana. We set up camp just before dark, around 6 p.m., but about 45 minutes, my friend got a text from his girlfriend and left. I was alone, but I'll admit, I was enjoying the peace and quiet. Around dusk, while getting the fire started, I heard a rustling in the woods about 30 yards away. I didn't think anything of it at the time, thinking it might be a deer. After about 10 minutes, I heard the noise again, but this time it was about 15 yards away. I yelled, hey, and the noise stopped. Five minutes passed, and the rustling began again, but now I heard grunting about the same distance away. Getting nervous, I yelled out again and said, knock it off. I'll admit it now that I was really more than nervous. I was getting scared. The noises stopped, but only for a few seconds. And again, I heard a grunt. I stood up, fearful, but knowing that whoever was messing with me should know I wasn't to be toyed with. I yelled, I have a gun. Don't F with me. Again, the noises stopped. Ten minutes passed. I felt I must have scared them off with my announcing I had a gun. I relaxed back and stoked the fire, which was now roaring. Looking at the flames and feeling their warmth, a craving for a cold beer came to mind. I got up, grabbed the cooler, and brought it down to the fire. I sat back down, and as soon as I opened that beer, the grunting started again. This time, it was just feet away. I looked, but couldn't see anything, because it was coming from just outside the glow of the fire. I had a mix of fear and anger now. All I wanted to do was enjoy a nice cold beer in front of a warm fire, but someone wanted to scare me. Aggravated, I yelled, just stop it. I'll do worse than shoot you. I'll shoot you and call the police. Now leave me alone. A thump from the darkness made me jump. It was loud, and it sounded like something had taken a large branch and smacked a tree. I downed my beer and tossed the bottle in the woods near where the thump came from. A second later, a branch came out and landed feet from me. That's it, I yelled. I got up, walked to the branch, and picked it up. I was about to throw it back when a scream bellowed. It was so loud, I could feel it reverberate off my body. My knees grew weak, and I felt nauseous. What annoyance or anger I felt melted away and was replaced with terror. I dropped the branch and stood quivering. My mind swam with a myriad of thoughts all focused on making sure I was going to survive the night. I finally got my wits about me and turned toward the cabin. I heard something exit the wood and race toward the cabin. I could hear the loud footfalls behind me and then to my left and finally ahead of me. I looked, but I couldn't see anything in the darkness. But... It had raced past me and was now probably waiting for me at the cabin. A little bit of ambient moonlight there was helping me see the gravel driveway. I made for that as my intention now was to get out of there. However, as fast as that thing had run, there was no way I'd outrun it. But hey, I had to at least try. 
I ran down the drive. My heart thumped and sweat poured from my brow. The nausea was still present and I had to do everything to not throw up. To my left, I heard crashing in the woods. It was now chasing me down the drive. The beam of the headlight showed through the trees. Someone was coming and I felt a wave of relief. I started to holler out, help. The headlight made a turn and was now on me. I couldn't make out who it was, but it was someone and I wasn't alone. The car stopped and I heard the door open. Someone called out my name. I recognized it as my friend. I couldn't see it first because I was blinded by the light. I ran up to him with tears in my eyes. He could see how upset and scared I was. What happened? He asked. Something is chasing me. He at first laughed and then I saw his eyes widen. What the? He said as he pointed ahead of him. I looked back and now saw for the first time the thing that had been chasing me. In the center of the drive, standing at least eight to nine feet tall, was this hairy, large creature. I could make out its chest heaving with each breath. It was completely covered in thick black hair from the top of its head all the way down to its feet. My friend's girlfriend screamed from inside the car. Let's get out of here, I said and got in. My friend didn't hesitate. I got behind the wheel, put the car in reverse, and slammed on the gas. We tossed rocks as we spun out. I kept my eyes glued on the creature. It didn't move. It stood in the middle of the drive, staring at us. My friend backed up until he found a spot to turn around. He was frantic and mumbling something nonsensical, while his girlfriend kept repeating, What was that? What was that? We drove to my friend's place, where we assessed what we'd all seen. We had left all of our gear out there and argued on when or if we should get it. I finally decided to go back the next day. Upon arriving the next day, at around noon, I found the cooler destroyed and what gear we had left outside tossed about. What we had stored in the cabin was fine and untouched. I gathered everything up and left without seeing or hearing anything. All I can say is I know what I heard and most definitely know what we all saw. It was a Bigfoot. There's no doubt about that. So, if anyone ever says these creatures don't inhabit the Midwest, just know they're either lying or just ignorant because they do exist. On to the next one. In the summer, my friend Hank and I headed up to Oregon to hike the Eagle Cap Loop via South Fork Imnaha to Kettle Creek Trail. I know that's a mouthful, but that's the name attached to where we were. This trail is located near Halfway, Oregon, and is slightly under 40 miles in length. I would not recommend this hike to anyone, except for the most experienced hikers. You are following a magnificent loop through the Eagle Cap wilderness while circumnavigating Eagle Cap itself, which is a magnificent spectacle. There are spectacular views which abound in every direction as you make your way through several glacial valleys and over three different mountain passes. There are also numerous lakes along the route where one can take a swim or fill your canteen. I have hiked more than a thousand miles, much of which was done right in the crux of where these creatures are said to live. And in all of those miles, I hadn't seen so much as a single indicator of their existence. We had spent five arduous days hiking this trail while stopping to camp at Horton Pass, Crater Lake, and Little Fraser Lake as well. As we were navigating our way down Little Creek through all of the lower switchbacks, everything was extremely overgrown with brush and bramble, with piles and piles of bear scat everywhere. Now, we didn't see a single bear in spite of the amount of crap we had seen, 
which reminded me of people saying, why don't we see more Bigfoot? To which I say, if I can't see a bear in fairly open country where I can see for miles and have seen a hundred piles of crap, what are your chances of seeing a Bigfoot? On the day of our sighting, we were following the trail through a valley of golden-colored grass, with the sloping side of Eagle Cap in full view. This entire valley, as well as most of the lower slope of the mountain, was spotted, and in some places covered with spindly-shaped pines. They looked like spearhead, dotting the landscape. At some point, as we were hiking and ever looking forward on the trail, we spied out a herd of elk walking way up on the slope ahead of us and heading toward a cluster of trees. I would say the distance may have been a mile or better that we were looking, and it was after maybe 15 minutes or so that we were perhaps only 200 yards from the trees we saw the elk go into. I was actually looking in that direction, hoping to spy them out, exiting the trees or within them. I mean, that's why we were there to enjoy nature and take in anything that it brings our way. Just a few minutes later, we were maybe only 50 yards away from the edge of the tree line as several elk began to move out into the open from within the trees. Both Hank and I slowly squatted on the ground to watch. I don't think that 30 seconds had elapsed when the herd suddenly began to run, which immediately made me think bear attack a large grizzly, given the right circumstances and advantages, can actually run down and kill an elk. I expected at any moment to see a bear come running out in pursuit if it hadn't already made a killing within the trees. But what happened next was off the charts incredible. We had to have seen several dozen elk leave the trees at full tilt as we now stood watching the back of the herd. As the last one cleared the tree line, perhaps a hundred feet or less behind it, emerged a huge brown Sasquatch running at pace with the elk. Within seconds, all of the elk and the Sasquatch had disappeared from view, being blocked by some trees to our left, and Hank and I launched to our feet in the hopes of getting this all back in view. We dropped our packs as we ran, and within maybe forty yards, we could see the Sasquatch in hot pursuit. The elk scattered in every direction, but the Sasquatch had to have been running 30 plus miles per hour and was not giving up. The action was leaving us quickly, going into the distance when we saw a second Sasquatch come running out into the fray of the elk. There were now two of these beasts running after the herd. What we saw only played out for maybe 15 seconds or so, before all of the beasts had run into the brush and trees out of our view. We kept looking and hoping we would see either the elk or the Sasquatch again, or perhaps hear something, but nothing of the sort had occurred. We stayed there for almost a half an hour before we saw some elk up at a higher elevation walking along, and that was it. Not wanting to stay in the neighborhood with two Sasquatch looking for food, we hightailed it out of there. I don't think either of us ever hiked so fast and hard in all our lives. If I may, I would like to say something to all the people who hear what I've just told you. People think that they would like to see one of these creatures and take a few selfies. When I tell you that I was fearing for my life, that is an understatement. In hindsight, it was actually foolhardy to run into position to get a better look. The speed at which the first creature was running, coupled with the second Sasquatch exiting the woods like a rocket, left me thinking that if one of these was next to you on the trail and decided to launch an attack on you, you would be dead in the blink of an eye. This is coming from two men who were very well armed. A man or a woman would not even have time to reach for their gun before the beast prevailed upon them. The second creature came out of the timber like a motocross bike leaving the starting gate. It was an incredible burst of both speed and strength. It is also my opinion now, this is exactly how many missing persons have met their fate, being caught 
completely unaware, as well as being in the wrong place at the wrong time. The first Sasquatch appeared to be at least several feet taller than a large bull in the herd and actually dwarfed some of the smaller animals. The way this whole thing went down, I'm sure that they got what they were gunning for within the tree, but we weren't going to find out. On to the next one. Until about two years ago, I lived in New Brunswick, Canada for 14 years, and for the last two years, I have relocated back to my birthplace in the good old USA. Working for a pipeline company, I have traveled a lot until my recent retirement, and when I was hunting deer this last season with my cousin, we came across a set of tracks that were about the size of my size 12 boot, but they looked to be barefoot. The one print was pretty clear because it was in an area of hardened mud and it had dried really plain and even showed the toes quite clearly. At first, we both thought it was our nearby neighbor, old Charlie, because he likes to keep his feet tough and he only wears boots when it's winter or when he goes to town. Looking closer at the tracks, though, and following them across the other side of the bog, we found a couple more, and they were up on the far bank, and two prints were almost perfect impression, like a plaster cast I remember making in school as a kid. I think my mother kept my handprint for years. These two prints had hardened in the sun, but you could tell they weren't human, because on both of them, you could see claw marks. Very plain, there was one great big toe and four narrower and longer toes. The big toe print had a sort of stub-like claw that was wide, but not all that long, and the other four toes had what looked like long, narrow claw-like extensions about two inches out from the end. And at the very tip of the claws were deeper cuts that seemed almost like they dug in maybe because the animal was climbing out of the low area and on up to the bank. Neither Jimmy or I had stayed in the area after ending our schooling, but here we were some 40 years later, both within 10 miles of where we grew up, and after all these years, we finally found sign of the swamp critter we had both heard about as kids, but never before seen. About the time we were getting ready to leave, there came old Charlie, hiking across the ridgeline of his high ground. And when he saw us, he waved and came over to see what we were doing out in this worthless ground, as he put it. We retraced our steps to show Charlie the prince, and without a second's hesitation, he said, Rougarou, whatever that meant. Then he explained that this was the same type of critter that many of the locals called the Bigfoot or Swamp Man, pretty much one of a dozen such names. It seemed not too alarming since everybody just called it by what they wanted, as I remembered hearing long ago. Charlie told us that his father had many stories that kept him in fear of the swamp giant when he was growing up. He told us that his dad's brother, Uncle Waldo, had lost his arm as a youngster when the swamp man had come out of the woods and attacked him. When he and their mother were picking berries, Charlie said the Bigfoot had jacked the berry basket so violently out of Waldo's hand that his little arm just snapped. He said the local men took up arms and went on a week-long hunt for the animal, and he couldn't remember quite well enough, but he thought the hunting party had killed two of them. But the common belief was they had powers like witches. For that reason, his dad told him that his brother Waldo's arm was added to the bonfire where they burned the two Bigfoot creatures. Ghastly as it sounds now, Charlie said back then, they believed that everything that could have been contaminated or bewitched by these evil beings had to be totally destroyed. Charlie said his uncle Waldo was never quite right in the head after that, and after all these years, to see the beast maybe moving back in again had a lot of the old-timers worried. As he looked at the track we had found, Charlie let out a sort of sigh and said the town council needs to know about it. Then he turned to us and asked, ready to go hunting? 
We're still waiting for an invite. On to the next one. In Glover, Oklahoma, at 6.30 p.m., it was about seven feet tall. It had long, reddish hair. The hair on its arms hung down about six inches or more. There was another car in front of me. He walked behind that car to cross the road. When he did, he was right in front of me, took three steps, and when he crossed the road, I went back to see if I could see him, but he was gone. I saw him very well, and no man could step as far as he did in three steps. It was at least seven feet tall, with long reddish-brown hair. Its arms were very long, and he looked to be built very solidly. The area was very thick, wooded, big oak trees with swampland about one mile from Little River, on the old highway between Glover and Millerton. The highway crosses the river by a bridge called the Golden Gate Bridge, like in California, but a lot smaller. He was about one mile from the south of the bridge. I have heard other stories about other people seeing him, and hearing him maybe now other people from the area will come forward. On to the next one. Various newspaper articles reporting possible Bigfoot near Tahlequah, Oklahoma. The first report was at a mobile home near Eldon, Oklahoma, which is east of Tahlequah at the junction of Highway 65 and 51. A woman living in the mobile home reported to Cherokee County Sheriff's Department that she heard noises and noticed a bad smell. She then observed a creature approximately 10 feet tall and about 400 pounds. Deputy Joe Weevil investigated the report and found impressions big enough to place both feet in. Two days later, an eight-year-old girl and her mother described a similar creature going through a trash pile near their house. Their dog chased it, but returned with it tail between its legs. The creature was described as eight feet tall, with dark brown frizzy hair and similar to a bear, except that it was described as walking upright. Oklahoma Wildlife Department District Chief Joe Adder said he had received several calls regarding the animal and believed it to be a bear. He said he had nothing to base that on, and it was unusual for a bear to walk on its hind legs for very long. There were noises and a bad odor before the sighting. The creature was observed digging through a trash pile. There were three witnesses in total, within and near their residences. The sightings were in the daytime, and it was very dry, rolling wooded hills near Barren Fork of the Illinois River, native blackjack, oak, and evergreen trees, several reports in the area since the early 70s, also possible reports near Peggs, Oklahoma, north of Tahlequah, Oklahoma. On to the next one. In Caddo County, Oklahoma, we were driving north about a mile or two from my mom's house in the back roads of Sector, driving about 40 miles an hour. We were taking my sister back home, who lives about eight miles away, when all of a sudden we saw what looked like a grayish-looking football player streak across the road. It was very fast when it ran across the road. I know it wasn't no deer, because whatever it was, it was on two legs, grayish, and was built like a football player, meaning it was thick on top like it had shoulder pads on. I've never seen an object like that ever. I can't exactly say what I saw, but all I know is that I saw something weird. If it was a Bigfoot, in my opinion, from this happening of why they are so hard for people to prove, it's because they're so incredibly fast. Maybe that's why they're so hard to prove or get a hold of. All I know, they are extremely fast. We didn't stop or nothing. We were too scared, so we just kept driving. We were in a little bitty car, a 79 old Datsun, so I know I couldn't run over it or something. It was a dirt road with trees all along the road. My husband, my sister, and me were just driving my sister home, and we were the only witnesses. On to the next one. This was in McIntosh County, Oklahoma. It was summer on a moonlit night. My then-boyfriend and myself were standing outside after a date, saying our goodbyes 
and both leaning with our back toward his pickup truck. We were facing our pasture behind the house that I grew up in. We were talking quietly and not moving much. My parents have a propane tank which is silver in color and approximately 20 to 25 feet long that sits approximately 500 yards behind their house. As we were both looking towards the pasture, we noticed something approximately 7 to 8 feet tall running across the pasture. It became more visible as it ran in front of the propane tank and was running in an upright position. It was dark in color. It ran southwestward toward the tree line of the pasture, but distinctly we could see it turn and look at us as it ran. Simultaneously, my boyfriend and myself asked each other if we saw that and ran into the house telling my mother. She grabbed a flashlight and shone it toward the pasture and saw nothing. It was nighttime, approximately 10.30 p.m. It was a balmy evening and moonlit. There was a wooded area very nearby. There was a small creek bed located approximately 20 yards from the incident. A nearby neighbor was deer hunting on the hill located approximately a quarter of a mile from the incident and claimed to have seen something walking upright through near where she was hunting with her husband. She described a distinct smell and actually saw the hair color of the creature. This incident happened approximately three or so years after my incident. On to the next one. This happened in Tillamook County in Oklahoma. I was 17. Me and my friends were going to the airport in Frederick, Oklahoma. My friend's dad owned a helicopter manufacturing plant that was located at the airport a few miles south of town. We were going to get some paperwork for a trip we were taking during spring break. It was about 9 p.m. or later. It was dark. There is an access road that leads to the hangar, which is at the south end of the airport. I believe the field on the passenger side of the van on my side was a plowed field. Me and a friend were talking, and I saw something out of my peripheral vision in my window. There are various lights scattered out there on buildings and such, but mostly it's very dark. At first, I thought it was a reflection from inside the van when I glanced. Then I turned my head to look, and there it was. I would say approximately 15 to 20 yards directly to my right, striding our speed. It seemed easily. I would guess it was 20 miles per hour. It has been a long time, so forgive my accuracy. I would say maybe it was a bear or something else if it wasn't so clear to me what I was looking at. It looked just like the majority of the pictures and clips I've seen over the years, almost identical to the really popular ones like the one that gets all the press where it is striding across the open area, kind of rocky terrain. And almost just like the clip, I was looking, trying to come to terms with what I was looking at while it is running, and it turns its head and is looking at me. It had dark black hair. It seems to me the face was dark like the hair, but being dark, it is hard to say for sure. The whole face wasn't covered. I could make out some features because I remember a kind of indifferent expression on its face as we were staring at each other. It had the same kind of gait as the video and seemed not to be laboring to run as fast as he was. I could not even talk. My friend did not see it. We got to the hangar, which was about a quarter of a mile down the access road in the same direction it was going. That is when my friend knew I was serious. I would not get out of the van to go in to get the paperwork and told him I'm going to leave him if I see that thing. We decided to come back the next day. The airport is very secluded, mostly flat fields, a couple of creeks with tree lines, but overall flat and open. But the Red River is only four or five miles away and I could see him there, but I don't know why it would venture to where he was. I have told only five or six people over the years. I think I would have rather seen a UFO. The looks you get when you say, I saw Bigfoot. It was about 9 or 9.30 p.m. Sparse lighting scattered around. It seems that it was fairly cool, maybe in the low 50s. On to the next one. In Yale, in Westminster County in British Columbia, on the Fraser River, in May of 1956, Mr. Stanley Hunt, a well-known auctioneer of Vernon, 
saw a hairy humanoid near Flood Township, south of Yale. Stanley was in a car that had to slow down to permit the hairy humanoid to cross the road. The creature was immense and covered with gray hair. There was another hairy creature waiting for it on the other side of the road. Both were gangly and not stocky like bears. We have been seeing hairy humanoids in this particular area since 1864. In the Bella Coola Valley in British Columbia in December of 1958, George Robinson and Bert Schohel, a pair of hunters, saw a seven-foot-tall Bigfoot watching them that ran off when they stared back at it. Also in 1958, near New Hazleton in Prince Rupert County in British Columbia, two women saw a Bigfoot crossing the road in front of their car. Lawrence Hopkins saw a strong-smelling Bigfoot in the brush on Aristizabal Island in British Columbia during March of 1959. At Hidden Lake east of Enbury in the Okanagan Valley in Yale County in British Columbia during autumn of 1959, Mr. and Mrs. Bellevue were camping at duck when Mrs. Bellevue was collecting firewood. She felt as if she were being watched. Then she saw a human-like creature, six feet tall, about 50 feet away. It was covered with rust-colored hair, except for parts of its face, a slit for a mouth, and a flat area with two holes in it for a nose. The forehead was sloped back. While digging clams on Prince Island near British Columbia, Mr. Joe Hopkins saw a small Bigfoot walking up the beach and into the trees. This was in February of 1960. Near Nelson in Kootenai County in British Columbia, in October of 1960, Mr. Bringsill saw a 7 to 9 foot tall hairy humanoid that left 16 to 17 inch long footprints at Watson Bay on Roderick Island in British Columbia. During winter 1960, Timothy Robinson and Samson Duncan shot at a small Bigfoot on a beach. They found blood on the snow where the creature had been, but were too afraid to follow it. At Ruby in Caribou County on the Fraser River in British Columbia, in 1960, Mr. Paul Peters, an Athabascan Indian, saw a hairy humanoid on the north side of the river near his fish camp when his dogs started whining and acting strangely. Paul then saw a humanoid a hundred yards away that was manlike very tall, covered in black hair, with a very stocky build, and very muscular. The Bigfoot was six and a half feet tall. There have been hairy humanoid sightings here previously in 1941 and 1949. In Coconee Glacier Park in British Columbia in October 1961, John Bringsill, a Bigfoot hunter, stated that he saw an ape-like creature on the trail at night. Mr. Brinksill had previously seen a Bigfoot, previously near Nelson in Kootenai County in November of 1960. Near Morristown in British Columbia, sometime in 1961, a man and a woman were sitting at breakfast when they saw a black, eight to nine foot tall Bigfoot walking across the field and then across a road. At Bella Coola in British Columbia in April 1962, a woman and her children saw a female Bigfoot holding a youngster by the hand on the banks of the Bella Coola River. Also in Bella Coola, in April of 1962, a Bigfoot along with two youngsters were seen. Was this the same as the other sighting that ape in the same area, but the Bigfoot had found another youngster? Or was it a different Bigfoot? At Stony Lake near Hickson in British Columbia in July 1962, Mr. Alex Hinstrom, whilst out on the lake, saw a heavily built, eight-foot-tall Bigfoot on the shore that left quickly as he approached it. On the 7th of August in 1962, at Lemon Creek near Nelson in British Columbia, Mr. John Brigsill, a woodsman and hunter, was picking huckleberries when he suddenly saw a seven- to nine-foot-tall Bigfoot with four-inch-long gray-blue hair covering its body walking slowly towards him. The creature seemed curious 
and when it got to within 40 feet of John, he sprinted for his car and drove away. John seems to attract them. This was his third reported sighting since 1960. Near Hickston in British Columbia in August of 1962, a woman saw a seven-foot-tall Bigfoot walking towards her while along a creek bed. On seeing the woman, the Bigfoot jumped into the bush. Between Quinnell and Prince George, just off the Caribou Highway in British Columbia, in August of 1962, Mrs. Calhoun was waiting in a small creek, waiting for her daughters to return with their lunch. Whilst waiting, she heard a noise that she at first thought was her daughter and turned to speak. To her, she saw the half-human, half-animal eyes of a strange creature that was observing her. She picked up her hunting rifle to protect herself from this creature when it appeared human with very long arms. It had small black eyes and blonde brown hair on its chest and long, loose, matted hair on its head. The creature had high cheekbones, a wide, flat nose, a sloping forehead, and a mouth that just stuck out. The creature made no noise or sound, though it moved its lips, and then it jumped into the bush and disappeared. Between Vetter Crossing and Yarrow, southwest of Chilliwack, one night in October of 1952, an off-duty bus driver named Joe Gregg saw a Bigfoot that crossed the road in front of his car. At Goose Point near Anaheim Lake in British Columbia in 1963, Mr. Harry Squines was preparing for bed when his tent flap opened and a hairy monkey face with human eyes peered in at him. Harry snatched up a light which did not work, so he ran outside and threw some petrol into the campfire. In the light produced, he saw four ape-like creatures lying down about 14 feet away, as if trying to hide. They then jumped up and walked off into the darkness. Harry yelled out to them, but they appeared to ignore him. There were no footprints, but there was a huge lone handprint up on a tree trunk. On Nicoman Island near Mission in British Columbia on the 31st of May in 1965, Mrs. Seraphine Jasper saw a tall black Bigfoot in the field in daytime. The cows were staring at it. At Pitt Lake in Westminster County in British Columbia on the 28th of June, 1965, 25 miles northwest from Vancouver, two brothers, working as prospectors for mining companies, were at an elevation of 4,000 feet. There was deep snow everywhere, though it was a sunny day. At noon, they were hiking into a valley when they found tremendous footprints that led to a small frozen stream. A short while later, and further on, they saw a 9 to 10 foot tall hairy humanoid. The creature covered in auburn hair. The arms were longer than a human's and hung below the knees. The hands were huge, like yellow canoe paddles. The creature just stood there, transferring its weight from one foot to the other as its hands went back and forth. The witnesses sketched the Bigfoot before it walked off, still in Pitt Meadows that same month, June of 1965. Two witnesses out hunting saw a hairy humanoid 10 to 12 feet tall that left footprints 24 inches long by 12 inches wide. On Princess Royal Island near Buttedale in British Columbia in July of 1965, the witness was a shore walker from Buttedale who was out fishing when he spotted two giant bipedal creatures on an inlet 75 yards away. They were covered in hair and were heavily built. The witness then saw something in the water heading straight towards him and reasoned that it was another of the creature. So he started up his outboard motor and fled. He also saw another two of the creatures standing on the mainland beach. During October of 1965, on the Alaskan Highway 97, at approximately mile 91, reference point marker near Fort St. John in British Columbia. In 1965, my family was moving from mile 101 on the Alaskan Highway to Fort St. John, B.C., mile 42. It was around 6.30 p.m. when we were headed up and around a curve in the highway, mile 91, and a large figure crossed in front of my father's pickup. My older brother and I were in the back of the camper looking through the window at the road 
when we saw it. My father, mother, and younger brother were in the front seat, and they also saw it. When we stopped at Mile 73 Cafe for Pop, we asked our dad what it was, and he said in a nervous laugh that it was a big, drunken, hairy Indian. We never spoke of it, yet it would come up several times over the years. We would always laugh it off. When we were younger, my brothers and I would refer to it as a werewolf. About three days after the event, we watched a movie on CBC. I think it was Lon Chaney as the werewolf. We had been watching the road, counting telephone poles. This was in the early evening. It was mixed boreal forest with steep slopes along the highway. At Green Bay near Bella Coola in British Columbia, in November of 1965, Mr. Jimmy Nelson was hunting several thousand feet up a mountainside when he saw a hairy, man-like form ascending a logger slash in the mountainside. The creature was large, and as Jimmy watched it for ten minutes, Jimmy took two hours to traverse the same course that the creature had merely stepped over. During May 1966, on a dirt road west from town near Villamanchine in British Columbia, I have a Bachelor's of Science Geology degree from the New Mexico Institute of Mining Technology. In 1965, I was plant manager for a remote plant owned by the NL Industries Incorporated, located about seven miles northwest of Spillamanchine, B.C. on a public road. The plant is on the west face of Spillamanchine Mountain. Since I was young, 31 at the time, and having only worked for the firm for little more than a year, I was reluctant to make my finding public. Now that I am retired, I no longer have such feeling. On an early May 1965 morning, I drove up the road from the mill site on a grizzly hunt. About half a mile above the mill site, there is a small clearing of about an acre on the east bank of the Spillamanchine River. Just north of this clearing, the road makes a dog leg left and there is a road cut on the right side of the road about four foot high. On the first occasion, a line of footprints came from the direction of the Columbia River Bridge in a northeast direction. Second, I came to the clearing from the north on foot and came upon three creatures I thought were grizzly bears, but they were upright and were scuffling. Two began mating in the normal human fashion instead of from the rear. I was about a hundred yards away from them and took a shot at one with my rifle, but missed, and the three ran into the woods to the east. It was a clear, early morning with four inches of fresh snow. At Richmond on Lulu Island in Vancouver County in British Columbia, on the 14th of July, 1966, Don Gilmore saw a big, woolly Bigfoot-like animal stampede 100 cattle on the number 8 road. The creature was manlike. Near Richmond on Lulu Island on 21st of July in 1966, John Osborne, a commercial artist at the foot of Number 3 Road, saw a hairy humanoid that was 6 foot 8 inches to 7 feet tall. The man-beast was seen for 10 to 15 seconds in the woods. It left no footprint. Don Gilmore saw a hairy humanoid there, the first ever reported in the area, only one week before. Was it new to the area? Had we met him before in the same area? On that same day, and also near Richmond on Lulu Island, on the 21st of July in 1966, Darlene Sheep saw the head and shoulders of a Bigfoot standing above six-foot-tall raspberry bushes at night. The following day, on the Fraser River near Richmond, John McKernan was in a car when he saw Bigfoot cross a dirt road. Near White Rock, not far from Richmond, Mr. Leodel saw a light-colored Bigfoot come up to his house and start fooling around in the moonlight. In August of 1966, at a large campground on the main highway in Penticton in British Columbia, one morning, the family awoke and my mother was extremely upset, white as a ghost, as they say. I had only ever seen her like this on one occasion when a small child fell out of a car window while making a turn in front of her as she left a parking lot. She told us that something had been outside the tent trailer that night. A cheap styrofoam cooler that had been underneath the trailer had been broken up, but not strewn about. Several food items were missing from it, 
My father passed it off, saying that it probably had just been kids or a bear. I was 14 at the time and the oldest. Later that morning, while my mother and I were alone, she said to me, whatever was out there last night wasn't a bear, and it wasn't a man. I don't know what it was, but I could see its shadow on the tent wall. I didn't know what to think at the time. I remember feeling like she wanted someone to believe her, as I'm fairly sure my father probably would have told her that she was just imagining things. She didn't start to calm down until late in the afternoon. She gave me no more details in regard to size, smell, or noises. It wasn't until years later, after reading several Bigfoot books, that I realized this may have been a Bigfoot encounter. It was sometime after midnight and before dawn. There was a street light in the campground about 50 to 100 feet from the trailer. It was about 20 off the ground. It was a semi-arid valley that was flat with a few trees. Penticton is bordered by Okanagan Lake on the north side of town and the Skaha Lake on the south side of town. There is a river that connects the two lakes that runs through the center of town. Between Vancouver and Chilliwack, on the Fraser River in October of 1966, several engineers on a geological survey saw a hairy humanoid on the shores of a lake. It was viewed for half an hour. Footprints were left behind in the snow which were photographed when the witnesses came back later. During February of 1958, Tom Brown and Harry Wannock, a pair of fishermen digging for clams, saw a six-foot-tall hairy humanoid looking at them. The hairy humanoid probably wanted the clams. This was on the south shore of Broughton Island, 25 miles northeast of Alert Bay, on Queen Charlotte Strait in Vancouver County. At Salmon Arm Inlet in Yale County in British Columbia on the Salmon River on June 27, 1958, Gordon Baum, a logger, saw a five-foot-tall, small hairy humanoid that jumped over a four-foot-tall pile of logs and ran on two legs much faster than a man. He was gone in two seconds, Gordon said. A bear could not run that fast and especially not on two legs. Bears travel at a speed loping along on four. If it was not a bear, what was it? A bear would have scaled an object such as a fence by pulling itself up and over. It cannot jump over it. Near Mount Stewart in British Columbia, in mid-August 1968, two hunters saw a Bigfoot over seven feet tall running up a hillside at dusk. The creature had a short neck, a flat nose, and long arms. The two men were driving their trucks along an old mine access road at 1,200 meters, looking for grouse and bear. They stopped when they saw what they thought was a bear crossing the road ahead. In fact, it was climbing up a slope on two legs. When it turned around, they saw a dark face with a sort of beard. The thing's arms went down to its knees and grabbed a tree as it walked away. In September of 1958, on the corners of Marsden and Lake Trail Road in Courtney, B.C., we had been away for the weekend to my aunt's place in Coombs, British Columbia. We arrived home late about 2 a.m. early Monday morning. I can remember the moon was so bright, it was just like daytime. When I got out of the car, I looked around the area and stretched my leg. After the long drive home, we lived right on the corner. We were the only one that lived on the corner. On one corner was a pasture with trees and bush around its perimeter. On the next was forest. Also on the other was forest. As I was looking around, my eyes caught on something across the road. In each of the corners were telephone poles. And on the telephone pole, just kitty corner from me, I noticed a large form standing in the ditch behind the pole looking at us. I could make out the shape of a head and the body. The head was to one side of the pole, while I could see the shoulder sticking out from both sides of the pole, and I could see the shape of its legs down to its knees, and the rest was in the ditch. It was dark, but yet it wasn't because I could make out lighter patches on the body and the face, and it stood absolutely still. Even when I said to Dad, Look over there, Dad, what is it? Dad was tired from the drive home, and he just wanted us kids to get in the house and go to bed. But he did look in that direction for a few seconds 
and the next thing he was hustling us into the house. The next day, I went over to the area and looked around the telephone pole looking for tracks. I noticed the ditch was about two feet deep, so whatever was in there was quite tall. I found nothing there but muddy water. The feeling I got when I saw this thing was very eerie. Growing up in this area, there's always some noises, dog barkings, etc. going on, but that night, it felt like a heavy silence. A few months later, when there was about four inches of snow on the ground, I was outside across the road at one of the trails that led into the forest, and I noticed footprints in the fresh snow. Getting closer, I noticed the prints were made by bare feet. I know what big feet are from my three brothers who all wear size 12 shoes, but theirs were nothing compared to these. I went back inside and told dad about the footprints, and he joked around asking my brothers which one of them was running around outside with no boots on. I could see every toe mark and the sole marks. It had been very crisp outside, so the prints looked quite new. It got to the point that I didn't like going along the trails in the forest anymore. It always made the hair on my neck stand on edge. Until my son was older and interested in Bigfoot sightings, I have not reported this story to anyone but close friends and to him. My friends laugh and say what an imagination I have, but my son was very interested. Everyone had dogs, even we had two dogs, and everything was so still and quiet that night. The thing I found unusual was it just stood there and watched us, not like a bear. I think a bear would be sniffing the air or clawing at the pole, but this thing just stood there. All in all, it took Dad, Mom, and my two brothers a good five minutes to get into the house, and I kept glancing back at it, and it never moved. There was a full moon because I could see it clearly, the road, the telephone pole, the house, etc. I think we were ending an Indian summer. It was mostly wooded back then. In one part, there was a swampy area, but further back in the woods, the trees were mostly fir and cedar. On to the next one. At a little camping site called Camp Alexo, west of Rocky Mountain House, the sighting took place when we all decided to take a walk one night. We all headed down a hill past the boys' cabin. We came to a set of railroad tracks, turned left, and started heading to an old cemetery we were all told about. We found the cemetery, and we all explored. Some of the graves were from the 1800 to the 1900. After about an hour, it started to get dark, so we all decided to head back. As we were going back up the track, we all of a sudden heard one of the girls scream. When we all turned around, we saw her flashlight shining up on this old tower. I wasn't ready to see what I saw, and to this day, my hair stands on end when I tell this, but on top of this tower, which itself was about 40 to 50 feet high, stood this creature. When we all shined our lights on it, it proceeded to jump off this tower. When it raised its arms to jump off, you could clear as day see the hair hanging from its arms. But what gets me is how it could jump off this tower like I was jumping off a one-foot-high curb. After it landed on the ground, it took off into the bushes. We could clearly hear trees breaking as it ran away. All of a sudden, there was silence. And then, about a minute later, there was this loud, eerily high-pitched scream that just went right through you. There was also a distinct odor lingering in the air. There were around 14 to 20 people. We were hiking. In the main cabin, there are articles and pictures of sighting from over the years around that area. It was approximately 9 o'clock. On to the next one. Near Jasper in Alberta, a friend and I were hiking on the Sulphur Ridge Trail. We came to a piece where the trail had fallen away, so we decided to stop for a break. We took out my camera to take pictures of the hot springs below. I happened to look up at the summit, and I noticed someone standing up there. 
I started waving because I thought it was a person. And since we were the only people on the trail, we'd be walking past them anyway. I even pointed my camera at it, but didn't take the picture because of the distance. The thing didn't wave back, and it was then that I really took a look at it. It was about 6 p.m., so there was plenty of light still. What I saw looked like a dark brown man covered with hair. It stood upright and had arms and legs like a human. After several minutes, it started to run down the face of the mountain. We were below the tree line, but well in sight of the summit. At that point, I said, holy bleep, that guy is nuts. I thought it was a mountain biker because he descended so quickly, about one and a half minutes at the most. It came straight down without using the switchback, and that's when I knew it wasn't human. I immediately thought it was a grizzly or other animal. When it hit the tree line, I realized it couldn't possibly be a bear because it stood taller than the trees. My friend and I hadn't heard of any sightings, so we didn't have any preconceived ideas of what we were looking at. We continued hiking to the summit mainly out of stupidity. We didn't talk about what we saw or what it could have been. When we hit the top of the tree line, I realized that there was no way a person could have ran down the face of the mountain the way we witnessed that thing do it. The face was covered with loose rocks and gravel, making it hard to descend at a fast pace, let alone a run. When we returned home, we talked to our roommate about the sighting and a friend said it must have been a Sasquatch. We returned the next day, but didn't see anything. We did, however, take note of the surrounding. The trees at the tree line were well over seven feet tall, and the creature towered over them. The area in which it ran is also a place where no human can get to. There are no trails, and it is too steep to try to climb down. The forest there is thick and green, and anyone who would stray off the trail could easily be lost. On the second hike, we heard something behind us on a descent for quite a few meters. Through the light trees, at the tree line, an animal of some sort stayed behind us. We had very little light left, so we were spooked and ran most of the way down. Hiking up the trail toward the summit, we had to take a break and I had my camera out to take a picture of the hot springs far below us. I took many pictures, scanned all of them to see if I got a picture of it, but I didn't. Sulphur Ridge is a range in the Rockies. It is a moderate climb that sees a lot of foot traffic in the summer. When we went up there, we saw only one other hiker. It is a lush forest. I would never stray off the trail out of fear of being lost. The summit is bare. It's high enough to see other mountain ranges, very windy on the top. On to the next one. Near Longview in Alberta, I had spotted two mule deer does from across the valley. They were making their way across the side of the west hill through the trees. I told my dad that I was going up after them, and he stayed and waited for our other hunting buddy and watched me as I went up through the trees. It took me about 15 minutes to get up to the deer. I came from the south end towards them, and they worked their way north across the hill. I got to within about 200 yards downwind from the deer through the trees. They started to get spooked, and... I tried a shot before they went out of range. I missed and the deer bolted through a gully and around the trees. I ran after them, trying to get another shot. I never saw the deer again and came out above the field, which was about 200 yards by 800 yards. I sat down on a log and scoped the valley and surrounding area with my binoculars, a 10 by 50. I saw a bunch of trees at the end of the field shaking and was looking through my binoculars when something came out. I thought it was a man dressed up and trying to scare away the animal as it ran down the hill with its arms swaying back and forth over its head. 
Thinking this, I went back down to where my dad and buddy were waiting. I told them about what I saw, and we all agreed as to what happened. The next Saturday, we went back to try our luck. My incident bothered me all week. So much, I made a point of going up to the area. I've been hunting in the same area for about 10 years, and what I saw just didn't add up in my head. The trees that were shaking are aspen, about 6 to 9 inches in diameter, and about 25 feet tall. The field that it ran down in about 10 seconds was so steep and snow-covered, about 1.5 to 2 feet deep, that it took me about 5 minutes to go down the 200 yards. It was 2 p.m. in the afternoon and sunny and cold. The ground was snow-covered and visibility was excellent. The creature was on the side of the west hill, three-quarters the way up the hill. It's a pine spruce aspen forest with a large open field in spotches. On to the next one. The Hopi. Their original homeland appears to have been Arizona and Colorado, as well as some of the adjoining regions of Utah and New Mexico. According to Idaho State Professor and Ph.D. Jeff Meldron, the Hopi tribe believed that when Bigfoot Sasquatch is seen, it should be taken as a warning sign from the Creator, not just for their tribe, but for all of mankind. As Meldrum notes, the Hopi consider Sasquatch to be a messenger who appears in evil times as a warning from the Creator that a man's disrespect for his sacred instruction has upset the harmony and balance of existence. From a story in the Native American Indian, written in 1930 by Edward S. Curtis, is the Hopi Indian legend of how evil sorcerers had put these Bigfoot-like creatures together for the sake of eating children, and... After it had been created, the Chivachu, as it is referred according to the book, prepared his home in the cliff. This is where the creature was described to live. And it's also a similar observation to where Bigfoot Sasquatch is sometimes described to live, from far more recent encounters. In the same book, the description of Suyuku, which is the female variant of the same described creature above, she is described as a female giantess who kidnaps and eats children that wander away too far from home. Again, we have the uncanny reverent to a female adornment of the same deity. From an article written by Wilson D. Wallace titled Folktale from the Shumpavi Second Mesa, 1936 edition of the Journal of American Folklore is another description of a Bigfoot Sasquatch-like creature from a story in the article titled, The Emergence in the Story is the Mention of a Mysterious Figure Called the Makawa Among the Shumapovi Hopi Tribe. The story starts out saying, Makawa lived in the north of Waban Asawa, a large mountain. A further terrified description of Makawa in the story is given as follows. Makawa has an immense head, is very tall, a giant. He is living now. If you do not believe it and think perhaps he is not living, he will hear you and frighten you. Something will hit you. You will feel drowsy and get stiff all over. He will frighten you. He will leave soon. You will recover and run home. A great many people have seen him. The author also notes of this being as quoted, a very large man. What else could it have been? The details of Bigfoot Sasquatch quite possibly having the ability to make people faint, pass out, forget what had occurred, lose their minds, or go insane is suggested among quite a few other tribes. The author describes Makawa's cry as follows. The cry is prolonged, starting on a high note and descending with diminishing volume to a low note, giving somewhat the effect of a siren whistle. From the short story, Makawa described in the following details. He was besprinkled with blood. He stank terribly, just like the dead. Both the descriptions of the cry and the smell associated with Makawa are both details fitting into much more current observations of Bigfoot and Sasquatch. Pawnee. 
predominantly but not limited to the areas in and around Nebraska. A Pawnee First Nation man tells Buffalo Bill Cody, an iconic figure in American history, a strange story of giant based on an old legend told among the Pawnee tribe. As mentioned in William Cody's 1879 autobiography titled Buffalo Bill, according to the book, the Pawnee man showed up with a giant-sized human thigh bone while at Buffalo Bill's camp. This giant human thigh bone had also been verified by a surgeon while there at the camp. The First Nation man then relates to the men present the story of how the giant thigh bone had once belonged to a race of giants who lived in that region long ago. The book explains the following details of the Pawnee legend of giants which had been killed off by a flood. These giants denied the existence of a great spirit, so he caused a great rainstorm to come, and the water kept rising higher and higher, so that it drove those proud and conceited giants from the low ground to the hill, and thence to the mountains. But, at last, even the mountain tops were submerged, and then those mammoth men were all drowned. After the flood had subsided, the great spirit came to the conclusion that he had made man too large and powerful, and that he would therefore correct the mistake by creating a race of men of smaller size and less strength. The Pawnee man tells Buffalo Bill Cody and his men that this story is actually a historic account among his people, and that it has been passed down repeatedly through generations of storytelling. Many Native American First Nation legends and stories of Bigfoot and Sasquatch are passed down in the same tales that also seem to detail past events and future catastrophes. Native American legends tell of Mount St. Helens actually being a volcano long before anyone else had known that. This was in the same story of the Skookum, which had also been addressed to Paul Kane in 1847 from members among the Multnomah tribe. The Kalamath First Nation had a similar notion. Two Crater Lake having one time been a volcano, which it was, in the same story where a strong demon was also described to throw a man from off a towering cliff. In the case of the Pawnee tribe, we get a story in an area where the Wichita had also made similar corroborating claim to giants, which they believed to have once lived in much the same area. The area where these two tribes had lived, Kansas, and next door in Nebraska, are flood plains without any mountains nearby, and both of these tribes had mentioned these giants as otherwise being extinct by a great flood, except for their bones, which were described by both tribes as sometimes still being found there in the same location, which, by the way, in this case, had also been verified by a surgeon while there at the same camp. It seems to make further sense that these giants were described to no longer live by both tribes in either Kansas or Nebraska because Bigfoot Sasquatch sightings are seldom reported from either of these two states, even today. Since both Kansas and Nebraska are mostly flat and there are no mountains there, which Bigfoot and Sasquatch is still mostly described to be encountered from prehistoric, historical, as well as modern accounts, yet the bones are described as still sometimes possibly being found in these same general locations by both the Wichita and Pawnee tribes. Could giants like Bigfoot or Sasquatch have lived in these locations in some time past as both the Wichita and Pawnee legend also seems to suggest? Many Native American legends of Sasquatch are not without suggestions like behavioral characteristics or other evidence. In this case, a Pawnee First Nation showed up at Buffalo Bill's camp with a story of giants which had once lived on the land and with a giant human-like thigh bone to help back up the story, the likes of which had also been verified by a surgeon who was there, present at the same camp. Not only that, this story connects rather strongly with a similar story told among the Wichita tribe who also lived in the same flat region next door in Kansas. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, 
and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!